Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. True Stone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. True Stone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. True Stone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Edina Eye Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years now in seven convenient locations. Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services and dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Democracy. I'm your guest host today, Steve Francisco. It's a real pleasure today to welcome to our studio a very old friend of mine, and uh, I should uh, explain. Reverend Martha Postlewaite is the pastor of the Recovery Church in St. Paul. Welcome, Martha. Thank you. And so I should explain that a little bit. Martha and I go back, we just realized, 50 years. She and I met in our uh, junior year of high school, and we both are graduates of Minneapolis Roosevelt High School class of 1974. We've been in touch since 1974 <laughs> periodically, but it's a real pleasure to have an old friend here today as our guest. Thank you for joining us, Martha. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure for me, too. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself after high school. Where did you go to college, and what did you oh. study? Uh, I went to college in Northfield, Minnesota. I went to Carleton. Um, and uh, against my, uh, <laughs> my own better judgment, I majored in religion. And wasn't your father a, a Methodist yeah, minister? Yeah, my dad was a Methodist minister, and I had refused to go to a school that required religion classes. because. Right. And then I, my fall term in my freshman year, I took my first religion class at Carleton because I couldn't get into other things. And the first book we read was Martin Buber's I and Thou, and I was kind of hooked. And you later went on to study at? Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Mm -hmm. And after um, uh, Divinity School, you also taught for many years, I understand, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the United Theological Seminary in St. Paul. Yeah. What did you teach yeah. there? I was um, the chaplain and the professor of spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sort of, st I moved on to the faculty the longer I was there. So mostly I worked a lot one-on-one -on -one with students and, um, and leading the chapel program, which mm -hmm. was very ecumenical and diverse and fun and gave students a chance to try you, it out. I heard you say something recently that actually surprised me. Uh, that was you were drag kicking and screaming into the ministry. Oh, um, yeah. Can you explain what you meant by that? Because well, those of us who know you and are friends of yours, we knew that your father was a Methodist minister. Yeah and thought, well, it seems like a natural progression that Martha might be interested in the ministry too, but that wasn't necessarily so. No, because my father thought that's what I should do. So that was my kicking and screaming part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I didn't, I could not imagine myself preaching. Mm -hmm. I had never seen a woman preach. The first woman I heard preach was me. Wow, that's interesting. And I still didn't, I liked being a chaplain better and doing the counseling. I had got a degree in counseling and a degree in spiritual formation. And I, I didn't think of myself as a preacher and, until I went to the recovery church. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the recovery church. What is the recovery church? Where is it? How was it started? Who started it? Okay. The recovery church is in uh, downtown St. Paul, right across the river from downtown. Uh, off Highway 52 and Play Plato Boulevard on State Street. 
Um, it was started 22 years ago by Joe Camp, who was a bigger than life, um, charismatic United Methodist pastor who had, who had gone through treatment and was in recovery himself. And he went to serve a little dying downtown church hmm. uh, that Which had was called Central Park United Methodist Church. Actually a very historic church, yeah, right? Was, going back to the 1800s, 1850s? Yeah, I think it was like the first one, maybe even the state. Right. Uh, so, and it was located across from Regions Hospital at that time. And he, he was actually thinking of reaching out to business people um, who worked downtown. But he was in recovering himself, and somebody said, why don't you have a recovery service? So uh, they decided to have a recovery service once a month, and he'll be the first to tell you they didn't know what they were doing. Um, but they kind of put this service together, and uh, 50 people showed up the first time they met. And after it had been going a while, people said, why aren't we doing this every week? And then the, the older people in the congregation who were left, like 15 people, they were welcoming and hospitable and adopted this as their mission and mm. their ministry. So they so, didn't leave. Interesting. So the Recovery Church is actually affiliated with the United Methodist yes. Church and you are an ordained United Methodist minister. Yeah. But your doors aren't limited just to United Methodists or no, even necessarily no. Christians, right? Say yeah. something about that. It's Who do you it's welcome It's very to the ecumenical. We, we really welcome everyone. Uh, it's kind of bring your own theology or bring no theology, and um, and that's part of what people are often exploring when they're in recovery. They've they've tapped into some spirituality in whatever their program is, if it's a 12-step program or another kind of program, and uh, those who are interested in growing spiritually. And what's ironic is there I don't think there are very many United Methodists there. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, I'll point out a little bit of the history, but the annual conference of the United Methodist Church really blessed that this be a church for an ecumenical crowd. And I am quite sure that the majority of people in our church are Roman Catholic. Interesting. But they accept me. So. And you even have some uh, former Jewish members or yep. members of the Jewish faith and mm -hmm. perhaps some other f faith traditions or even non-believers, A real right? spectrum, yeah. And, and, and in recovery, the God of your understanding um, is how often people talk about it. We are a church and we do serve communion every week. Mm -hmm. So, and we preach from the Bible. So it is a church, but there's no requirement. I see. You have written a book, which we're going to be referring to uh, during our talk today. It's titled Addiction and Recovery, A Spiritual Pilgrimage. I'm gonna hold it up here and perhaps we can get a close up shot of this book. Um, first of all, congratulations Thank on the you. book, Martha. I read it with great interest, and what really, several things really struck me about the book, uh, one of which was how honest it was It's in, in its appraisal of what the challenges are for people dealing with addiction, whether it's to drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it may be, but just trying to understand um, what motivated you to write this book. Um, well, I was invited to submit a proposal to Fortress Press. They were doing a whole series called Living with Hope. And I was invited to do the one on addiction. They were, they were living with grief and living, mm -hmm. losing a child. There were just several different things and there was a whole series of books being written. And they asked me to, to tell my story, to include biblical references do some exegesis and to uh, tell some of the stories of the church and to give some spiritual practices. So they kind of gave me the assignment. Mm -hmm. And part of the, uh, the nature of our church is every week people tell their stories. So as people were giving their five minute story of hope, I'd say, can I use that for my book? <laughs> I have to tell our viewers, too, that my wife and I happened to attend your church recently. Yeah. I sort of did it as my homework assignment in preparation for our interview today mm -hmm. because I knew you were the pastor at the Recovery Church, but I had never attended it. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had some sense of it, but, you know, as they say, there's nothing better than doing it. No. So no. I, we actually went to a Sunday service a few weeks ago, and... My wife and I both were just overwhelmed by how welcomed we were by the people there. 
but just by the authenticity of the service, hearing real life stories from people admitting that they had slipped off the wagon and perhaps had a drink or had tried drugs again when they were trying to get away from that, mm -hmm. hearing about a man standing right behind my wife and I in the, in the congregation who had recently had lost his sister just a few days earlier, mm -hmm. and how powerful these stories mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. um, you say in your book that you really found your spiritual home in the recovery oh. church. I, I snuck into worship a few times before I was interviewed there. Um, because I, I was a sort of a worship snob and I wanted to see what they did for their worship. And I what just... What do you mean by that, worship snob? Well, well I taught it, you know, and I, I thought, you do this, I, I, I approve of this, I don't approve of this, I approve of this. And they, I, I always say to them, they had me at hello because mm -hmm. I felt so welcomed. And they didn't know who I was, I was just slipping in the back. And the way people told the truth and the way they welcomed each other, I thought this is what I always thought church should be. You say in the book, this line really jumped out at me and I really loved it. You said the people who are attending the recovery church are the kind of people that Jesus would have hung out yeah. with. Say a little bit a more little about bit. that. Well, Jesus hung out with all the broken people. And you know, I think all people are broken, but people at the recovery church know they're broken and they're willing to talk about it. And I mean, that's who Jesus hung out with. Um, Not people who thought they were perfect no, or never no. made mistakes or never had problems. Um, why is the jack pine the symbol of the recovery oh. church? I notice it's on your church program yeah. and at the church. The jack pine is the symbol of the recovery church. Yeah, why? because the jack pine is, um, I think it's the only pine that has to go through fire to um, come back to life. And so that idea of rising from the ashes, you know, the phoenix, the, jacks, the jack pine, the resurrection, I think our two main themes are resurrection and grace. And resurrection is because most of the people have known what it's like to die to something and mm -hmm. to be given another chance at and life. And so fire, which we think of as a really destructive force of nature, can also be a restorative or regenerative force, yeah. is, is that the yeah. idea behind that's the it? idea, sure. Yeah, very interesting. Um, at the end of your book, you state that the words we use matter mm -hmm. when we talk about mm -hmm. people with addictions to alcohol, mm -hmm. drugs, whatever it may be. And uh, you reference the fact that there's a new lexicon that's been emerging around the subject mm -hmm. of e addiction and recovery. Mm -hmm. um, there's something even called the addictionary. Can you right. please explain right. what is the addictionary? Well, it's it's a fabulous resource. Um, you just addiction slash airy, and it's kept up to date on the web on a website. But it's really changing the language around how we talk about. Well, person first language, mm -hmm. um, instead of I have a disabled kid or I have a, an addicted kid, uh, my child is a person that deals with substance use disorder. Even saying the word, some people don't even like to use the word addiction, but ev even saying the word uh, substance abuse, it makes the person an abuser rather than a person with an illness. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the um, AMA, uh, People have changed their language at an upper level. Now you go to an AA meeting, somebody might call themselves a drunk, but you just generally don't want to call other people that. <laughs> that. Right, right. You have had your own experience oh, with yeah. addiction to alcohol. Yeah. And you talk about it very eloquently in this book, and, and it was very moving for what you revealed and the struggle that you've been through. Oh, yeah. How has your own experience with alcoholism equipped you as a minister, ministering to people dealing with addiction and recovery? Well, it's kind of a good fit. <laughs> Cause, experience. Because I'm one of them, and, uh, and, I'm, and, and in, in some churches you wouldn't share much of your personal story, but so much of healing from addiction is about the community and is about all of us sharing our stories. So um, yeah, I, and I, I guess I'd have to say that it was God's grace that I experienced. It was, ha it was halfway through my ministry, or 10 years in or something. So it wasn't, it wasn't what brought me to ministry, but it's what made it more real, mm -hmm. I think. Something we need to talk about when we're on this subject is the guilt, oh, the shame, shame. 
the burden that people feel when they are dealing with addiction. Mm -hmm. But we are talking about something that is an illness, and yet we have all sorts of judgments that attach to people who have alcohol. I mean, as an example, I recently had overcome prostate cancer and had surgery to remove it. Nobody I know would ever think twice to render a, I don't think they would render a judgment about me personally because I have prostate cancer. But people oh. addicted to alcohol and drugs, they do render those judgments. Yeah. Why do we have this double yeah. standard about judging people over addiction? Well, hopefully we're, that's, I actually wrote the book because it was written for church audiences because mm -hmm. I wanted churches to do less harm. And uh, I, there was some um, statistic I read about how many doctors and how many clergy still think of it as a personal failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so just to use different language and to include it with all the other things people suffer and recover from in this life mm -hmm. is important. And uh, yeah, it's... You know, it's um, interesting that words matter and that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about mm -hmm. with the idea of how we talk about it mm -hmm. but it's not just you know talking about something that well some people say you're trying to be politically correct about how you talk about addiction mm -hmm. and recovery but it's not really just about that it's it's oh. about it is a scientific fact yeah. that addiction has a physical component to it that the way yeah. people's brains are wired that lead them toward this self-destructive behavior, right? right? Oh, Say yeah. more about oh, that. Oh yeah, I mean it's a uh, it's a disease and it's a and it's a brain disease. And so in some ways it's a mental illness. Um, it's how your brain responds to substances. And uh, I mean that's that's been validated for so long now. And I think even to get churches to talk about it as a disease rather than as a sin. Mm -hmm. For instance, we hardly ever use the word sin at the recovery church because people have been felt so judged by the church and many people have felt very stigmatized. And I would guess it probably has driven many people away from the church oh, at yeah. the very time they may yeah. have needed spiritual yeah. sustenance, if right. you will. Right, right. Interesting. Um, do you find other churches that are... Um, how shall we say, trying to imitate some of your practices at the recovery church? Well, you know, we always get calls from around the country and people start trying to start a service or a ministry. Um, there aren't that many that, that whose whole focus it is. I mean, ours, ours is clearly that is our mission to give spiritual support to people who are trying to recover, mm -hmm. for recover from addictions. And, um, but other churches, there are some service, there's services at some churches. There are some other programs. Um, some of them are a little, they're kind of across the spectrum. I'd say uh, we're, a little, we're in the progressive area of theology. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, ministries that stay with the idea of sinner and right. if this you just is prayed not enough. A, the recovery church is not a fundamentalist church. No. <laughs> No. Or as some people may have in it, in eloquently said, Bible thumping and judging people. Right. That's right. not what the recovery church is no. about. No, and not judging other people is a big part of our. So kind of a question cradle. would be: Would a non-believer, would an atheist, uh, be welcome at the recovery church? And what could they gain from the experience of going to the recovery church? They'd be welcome. I mean, really, we say everybody's welcome. We really mean Come as you are, I yeah. think you said in the book. <laughs> and uh, they might not be totally comfortable because we are a Christian church. Mm -hmm. So we, our, our source book is the Bible. You know, some say the Bible in one hand, the big book in another hand. Right. Um, but they'd be welcome. So to what extent, I'm curious, after I read your book, I wondered about this question too. Um, to what extent is spirituality important or even essential to recovery yeah, from addiction? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, sort of the 12-step the programs are all based on a higher power. Mm -hmm. and Alcoholics Anonymous and maybe Gamblers Anonymous or some of the other programs. And Al-Anon, Al you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, spirituality is, is key, I think, to healing and to recovery, you know, in terms of a lot of life's um, hardships. Uh, 
I just lost my train of thought because you had said something. That's all right. <laughs> It'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I think is interesting, uh, why do you think it is that our society has stigmatized and even criminalized drug addiction instead of treating addiction as an illness? And oh. shouldn't our policymakers, we're talking about state legislators, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. local elected officials, Congress perhaps, Shouldn't our elected officials have a more enlightened view about how we approach yes. problems of addiction? Yeah, and there are many organizations, and I'd say that one of our goals is to destigmatize it. But there are organizations that do much more um, lobbying and, you know, try You don't. Try You're, the church doesn't, the recovery church. Some people doesn't. in the church do, May but do it on that, their own. Right. that's not our mission. We started two organizations when we started, and one was a. Um, organization called Minnesota Recovery Connection. They were going to be more the advocacy arm. And they're still at it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, I was just going to mention yeah. that it's there's really matters of equity, too. Talk about it, that. What do you it's, mean? Uh, I, I just mean that we've criminalized something. And um, it makes a real difference if when you go through something like a DUI or drug possession or something, it makes a difference if you're uh, if your judge tells you to go to jail or if your judge tells you to go to treatment. And more people in poverty and more people of color end up in jail. That's just a statistical Oh, fact. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there's real injustice in the whole thing. And, you know, the idea that uh, there are nonprofit organizations out there that work with people battling addiction yeah. in a addition to the church. The church is a type of nonprofit yeah. organization. Yeah. But nonprofits can't do it alone, can they? We still need to have government play some sort of role in helping to address these problems well, and helping people overcome addictions and become full productive members of society. Absolutely. Again. Abso it's, it's, it benefits all of us. I mean, it seems that there's a cost issue here too, isn't it? That we, you know, we don't think twice about spending enormous sums of money to incarcerate people oh. for addiction, but yet, <laughs> when it comes to getting adequate funding for treatment programs Absolutely. and diverting people from a path of prison to rehabilitation recovery, we're a little bit stingier with public resources. Oh yeah, and it would save us money in the long run if it's about if it's money you're caring about. It saves lives. It saves lives. More people are dying of opioid addiction and alcohol addiction in the last few years, and the pandemic has made it worse. I'm because, glad you brought that up. I was yeah. going to ask you, how has the pandemic affected the recovery church? Have you seen uh, an increase or surge in people coming to the church? Well, we were shut down for a while. Issues? We learned how to do it all online, and we're still putting it online, but we are meeting in person now, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that the general agreement that the the biggest challenge to people with addiction is isolation. So not being able to come together in community was really harmful to people with addiction because it is, you talked about is spirituality important? I know what I was gonna say, it was like, and the community is really important. Mm -hmm. So if you came to our church and you didn't have any spiritual beliefs, but you felt welcomed and you felt seen and heard and cared for, mm -hmm. that might be enough to come back. Mm -hmm. And you and I both grew up in the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. My family attended a large Methodist church in Minneapolis, Hennepin United mm -hmm. Methodist, very well-known church. Uh, so we came from that perspective, but I always wonder about people who don't come from that background or who are skeptical yeah. or maybe non-believers. Yeah. yeah. And how can they find something meaningful? Well, and they're, they're usually just delighted to hear a theology of grace. Mm -hmm. because they're expecting to be judged. I wanted and to ask you that. I'm really glad you just used that word because okay. I would have been upset if we'd gone through this and I forgot to ask you this. What is this concept of grace well, in Christian theology? Grace is central to Christian theology and it is sort of the unmerited, undeserved love of God. And however that comes to you, uh, maybe that you've been given a new start and somebody you know gives you a break or it may be that you just one day know that you are being held and carried by a loving God. Um, it's, sometimes it's forgiveness when you've done something you don't deserve forgiveness for, but that's God's nature is that unconditional love that we are loved no matter what we do. And Martha, is the concept of grace, I understand the Christian connection to that theological principle. 
Do we find something similar to that in other faith traditions, do you know? I wondered about that, if there's this concept of grace. Well, it's interesting because I've always sort of focused on grace, but I'm, I've become more interested in mercy. Mm -hmm. And I think mercy is sort of like grace on steroids. Hmm. And I think other faith traditions do have a sense of mercy. Um, now you'll make me go home and want to look into grace too. Uh, but the concept of mercy being forgiveness. Yeah. And, and for people in recovery, it seems like a lot of them, uh, people I have known, uh, we've all had family or friends or loved ones who have dealt with this problem mm -hmm. of addiction. And it seems like one of the hardest parts of recovery is forgiving yourself. Absolutely. Much less seeking the uh, forgiveness of family or friends or other people who have mm -hmm. been impacted by addiction. Yeah. 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 Often when people are in my office, that's what they're struggling with the most, you know. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say something they feel regret about, and I'll say, well, have you forgiven yourself for that? What are a couple of programs, real quickly, we're down to two minutes, a okay. couple of programs that the Recovery Church has for your parishioners, for the people who attend the church? You know, we do not have that many programs just for our parishioners, but we, we, ha we are in a facility that was chosen to have meeting rooms, mm -hmm. classrooms. And uh, there are different um, recovery groups that meet every day of the week. We probably have a thousand people come through. There are AA, there's uh, health realization, there's um, adult children of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the spectrum The spectrum of 12-step groups. How people are affected. Yeah, yeah. and so we ha we just open ourselves to a lot of meetings. Yeah, we don't have the normal church kinds of structures. You're a fortunate person, Martha, mm -hmm. because it seems you've landed in oh. exactly the right place for yourself, where yeah. you should be. Yeah. You're doing what you were meant yeah. to do, and uh, for that, I congratulate Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we want to show your book, um, Recover Addiction and Recovery, A Spiritual Pilgrimage by Reverend Martha Postlewaite. And again, where can people order your book if they wish to? Amazon. Amazon.com. Or Which Fortress where, Press. Or Fortress Press. It's published by Fortress Press. Right. And I would highly recommend it because it's a good book, not just for people dealing with addiction, but for those of us who have family members or mm -hmm. loved ones or mm -hmm. people we care about, co-workers. It'll give you a much better understanding of the struggle and the possibilities for recovery. And really, as you say, as we say in the Christ Christian tradition, resurrection. Yeah. 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 Reverend Thank Martha Postlewaite of the Recovery Church in St. Paul. Thanks so much for being our guest today on Thank Access you. to Democracy. Mm -hmm.